So this semester, as many of you will know, the theme is 70 years later, Japanese Canadians and the urban legacy of war. We have three lectures on that topic which commemorate and explore that uh, history of the uprooting uh, of Japanese Canadians from the west coast of Canada 70 years ago. The first lecture, of course, tonight uh, with my colleague Ruben Rose uh, Redwood will introduce in a moment uh, is a lecture by Audrey Kobayashi. Next month, on October 18th, the third Thursday in October, I will actually presenting, be presenting some of my research on the liquidation of properties in, in Vancouver and the decision by the custodian to liquidate. And then on November 22nd, which by chance is actually the fourth Thursday in November rather than the third, uh, we have a lecture by Joy Kagawa who will be talking about some of her reflections from her current fictional work exploring the history of cities and massacres in cities during the Second World War. Uh, for that final lecture, I'll just mention the, we anticipate that demand may exceed our capacity here, so we're asking people to pre-register. Uh, it's still free and open to the public, and all of you are welcome, but we're asking people to pre-register for that talk. You can pre-register, I want to get the email address correctly here. Um, you can pre-register for that talk by going to, uh, by emailing rather, thecitytalks.victoria at gmail.com and you can find um, that email address on our website, uh, thecitytalks.ca. So we'll have 80 spots or so for pre-registration, so uh, register if you're, if you're uh, intending to come and we hope that uh, all of you will. In addition, this uh, semester we have a new initiative that's going to be run by a graduate student in the history department, uh, Vincent Cornell, uh, that emerged out of some small initiatives that we've done already, and it's called the City Walks. So we have the City Talks, and we'll now begin with the City Walks. Uh, Vincent will organize after each of the, Vincent sitting right here, he's a regular attendee of the talks. I think he's attended more talks than any other member of the uh, public, uh, and uh, uh, Vincent is organizing walking tours on themes related to each of the talks. So he'll be trying to connect themes explored in the scholarly lectures with um, places, uh, the history, and events uh, here in Victoria. So uh, his first walk, connected with the themes of this lecture, uh, will happen on September 29th. They'll normally happen on a Saturday right after the lecture, but this time, Vincent, it being the beginning of the semester, is going to wait an extra week. Uh, so uh, all of you again would be invited on September 29th to meet at 10 o'clock at the corner of Fisgard and Store. His walking tour is titled Labor Migration and the Creation of Ethnicity in Victoria. And his walking tours, I've been on a couple of Vincent's walking tours, they're great, they're very interactive. He mostly asks questions and will prompt discussion from uh, the participants in the tour. And uh, all of the tours that I've been on so far, one of the very amazing things is to discover all of the knowledge that the various participants in the tour uh, bring with them to the tour itself. So they're really interesting, interactive, engaging tours I would strongly recommend. Um, in addition, this semester, I want to advertise a, an additional talk that is not connected with the three talks uh, on the common theme. We have also on November 8th a talk by Michael Katz, which is co-sponsored by the History Department's Lansdowne Lecture Series. Uh, and that, uh, Michael Katz is a, a prominent historian of American cities who teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. His talk is entitled, Why Don't American Cities Burn? It starts from the premise that the conditions that generated the urban unrest of the 1960s and early 1960s in the United States have, if anything, become worse since that time. And he asks why a similar kind of urban unrest has not continued in American cities. A very interesting book that he's speaking from, a very interesting lecture, Why Don't American Cities Burn? That's November 8th, at the same time, as our normal lectures, the lecture starts at 7.30. It's here at the Legacy Art Gallery, and you'd all be uh, invited as well. In January, a new set of talks will begin exploring the theme of healthy cities. Scholars uh, from the United States, from Australia, and Canada will talk about global initiatives to define what a healthy city is, 
and to produce healthy uh, cities. Uh, so that series you can read more about on uh, the City Talks website. I wanted to remember to thank all of our sponsors for the series. The series is supported by a grant from the Social Science and Research Council of Canada, as well as by every level of administration at the University of Victoria, uh, from the VPs down to through the deans and um, the departments of all of the members of the committee and interdisciplinary committee uh, at the university. I've also uh, I'm always instructed to remind you to check out our Facebook. Page and do we still have a Twitter feed or we have no Twitter feed? We do have a Twitter feed. We do have a Twitter feed. So if you're on Facebook or Twitter, you can check out the City Talks there. And the gallery asks us to remind you that uh, we're welcome to explore the gallery both before the talk and uh, immediately afterwards, um, but that there are uh, delicate pieces of art that we ask you to be aware of uh, while you're enjoying the talk. Uh, welcome to the City Talks, and I'll have Ruben Rose Redwood uh, from the Geography Department, a member of the Urban Studies Committee, introduce uh, Professor Kobayashi. Thanks, Jordan. Um, well, good evening. I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the City Talks. This is also uh, uh, a lecture co-sponsored by the Geography Department as part of the Lansdowne Lecture Series. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Audrey Kobayashi, uh, who's currently a professor of geography, uh, as well as the Queen's uh, Research Chair at Queen's University. Uh, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background about uh, Dr. Kobayashi, uh, after graduating, um, after completing her graduate studies from uh, at UBC, as well as uh, UCLA, uh, she uh, began uh, teaching at uh, McGill University in 1983, uh, and she taught there until 1994. Uh, when she then uh, moved on to Queen's University, uh, first as the director of the Institute of Women's Studies, uh, and later and currently as a uh, faculty member in the Geography Department. Audrey has published uh, extensively in the areas of human rights, uh, anti-racism, uh, immigration and employment equity, uh, as well as uh, looking at the historical geographies of uh, uh, Japanese Canadian communities. Many of her uh, projects link uh, her research with direct community involvement, uh, including a membership, uh, she was a member of the team uh, that negotiated, negotiated the Japanese-Canadian uh, redress settlement in 1988. In recent years, uh, Audrey has served in a number of important leadership roles, including as president of the Canadian Association of Geographers, as well as more recently president of the uh, America, uh, Association of American Geographers, or the AAG. Uh, and she has also recently just completed a 10-year term as one of the editors of the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, uh, which is really one of, the, uh, one of the leading journals in the field. Tonight, Audrey, as you see here, will be uh, uh, speaking uh, to us about one of her current research projects, uh, which is entitled uh, Destination Vancouver, the Role of Labor Migration in the Development of Powell Street. So uh, please join me in welcoming Audrey Kobayashi to the City Talks in the Lansdowne. Can you hear me all right in the back? With, with this level? Great. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much, um, both Jordan and Ruben. Thank you to the Urban Studies Committee uh, for the invitation and uh, to the Lansdowne um, Program, I guess it is what sounds like a, a wonderful program uh, for a university such as, as UVic. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I'm glad to actually see some of my cousins here, which is a, a huge uh, surprise and, and quite a few familiar faces in the room. Um, well, Ruth said that this is a current project. It's actually a, a very old project. It's been going on for years and years and won't go away. And it won't go away because uh, there's there's so much information um, still uh, to be uh, gathered and mined and talked about uh, when it comes to the development of Japanese Canadian or Nikkei um, communities um, in British Columbia. I like to think of cities as places in relation to one another not about this city or that city or this group of people within the city or that group of people, but rather about the larger picture of the ways in which cities are part of always a changing world. 
And British Columbia, at the turn of the 20th century, was very much at the, the confluence of many of the changes that were going on uh, in the world, many of the global changes that affected the way that people, goods, commodities, systems of organization, governmental practices uh, moved around the world. And so I'd like to ask you to start thinking about that sort of big process by which uh, cities became cities uh, and about the fact that for this province in particular, it was the turn of the 20th century uh, that marked uh, so much of the development of the urban structure uh, of the province. Of course, Victoria is much older than uh, Vancouver. Victoria has, of course, a very important legacy in terms of Chinese immigration, as does Vancouver, but in terms of the scale, the number, the impact upon building the city, uh, the Japanese immigration played a larger role for a very long time. Uh, in, in Vancouver for some very specific uh, uh, reasons of economic and political relationships between uh, Canada um, and Asia. And I can't say a lot about those, but the point that I want to start with is that we have to understand the contextual circumstances under which cities develop. We need to link the city to those larger economic and political processes, but at the same time, and uh, thinking about the scale at which I want to speak today, uh, I always think of cities as made up of those people who work there. The laborers who get up every morning and go to work and go home to their families and create families, communities, who populate the streets, who build the houses, uh, who build the stores and run the stores and who make the city work. And so what my, my focus today is upon those uh, thousands, uh, in total about uh, 30,000 uh, Japanese immigrants who came and went um, through Powell Street, through the streets of Vancouver um, in, in the years starting about in the 1890s uh, until, of course, as I'm sure everyone in the room knows, uh, 1942 when they were uprooted. Um, from Powell Street, which you're going to hear a lot more about next week, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to end um, at that period. So I'm going to begin, however, by talking about Japan uh, and the context in Japan that produced those men, women, and eventually children who became Japanese Canadians, who became the, the people who were Powell Street. So I'm a geographer. I'll start with a map. Uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this map or, or study it very carefully. And I actually have a laser pointer here, but I can't make it go up to the screen. So I'm going to try just with the, um, with the uh, uh, cursor here to show you that... Uh, how well is that showing up? Is, is it okay? So you can see the white parts, which are the areas of heavy emigration. Uh, this is Hiroshima Prefecture. Uh, Oops. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, uh, which was the largest source of immigrants to the entire world from Japan. Now, just very briefly, what happened is that Japan was a closed society, politically closed um, to the, re the rest of the world until 1868, which is the start of the, the Meiji period. Um, and the, the point at which Japan began, began the current phase of modernization, the establishment of economic and political ties to the rest of the world. Uh, and by 18, the 1880s, immigration uh, from Japan began to other parts of the world. And of course, in terms of Chinese immigration, it had started much, much earlier, and certainly in, in the context of this province. Uh, was uh, an important part of the gold rush days back in the 1850s. It was labor migration. It was people going out to work, not saying, I'm going to go off and emigrate to the US or Hawaii, which was uh, the major destination of those people uh, in, this, in these white areas uh, here. Um, no, they were going out to earn money, to come back to Japan, 
to build houses, to buy uh, fields where they could farm rice, because at that time in Japan, the highest goal of anyone in society was to become um, a farmer. So the process of urbanization that took place in Japan was a process, as it was in many other parts of the industrializing world, although much earlier in places like, like Britain and other parts of Europe, of people in the rural parts of the country moving to the cities to take the jobs that were fueling a whole new way of organizing both the, the economic and the political basis uh, of the country. Now, labor migration had occurred in Japan as in other places much earlier, but during the Meiji period, the last decades of the 19th century, it uh, increased many, many, many fold. And this is the, the time at which uh, those large um, industrial complexes, and you know all about them today because they're the names of all of the cars that most of you are probably driving, um, Toyota, Nissan, Mazda, etc. These were huge industrial um, organizations that were responsible for much of the migration from the rural to the urban areas of Japan. Um, emigration from Japan to other countries, which begins in the 1880s, was really just an extension of this process of sending mostly young people out from the villages to work in an urbanizing context and uh, make money and come back and, if possible, um, either carry on the family line if the head of the household happened to be, uh, if, if, the, if you were a first son who was expected to establish a new household, or if a second or third son uh, to establish another household within the village. But there was only so much land, there was only so much farm farming available, and the vast majority uh, ended up uh, in the cities uh, where they worked in pretty rough conditions as, as occurred in many other parts of the world. Now, the difference, uh, of course, was that despite the fact that they went to the US or Canada uh, as the two main destinations at that time and worked in, in often demeaning uh, labor, often for wages that were much um, lower than those of the white workers, despite the fact that they did the same work or even more, um, they still would earn seven times as much as they did in Japan, which meant that their chances of being able to go back uh, to Japan and establish and buy some farmland and build a house increased tremendously. Um, and I call this the paradox of the sojourner in that in order to maintain a traditional, a very traditional uh, way of life and family uh, in Japan, um, they went out to this modernizing industrial um, labor uh, which provided the basis to be more traditional. And I, I won't say more about that, it's, uh, there are lots of very complex and in interesting stories there. But the context is important because, um, again, two more maps, and all I would ask you to look at actually here you can see all three of them, is the fact that the white patches are very different. And I'm assuming that most of the people in the room haven't memorized the map of Japan, and so I'm not going to talk about these different areas uh, of the country. They are culturally very different. This is a country in which the prefectures, and these boundaries represent the prefectures, which are like provinces, uh, have very different uh, economic, social, political cultures uh, at least they think of themselves as having very different cultures. But what's important here is that the, the map on your bottom left is of the, the fishing industry in British Columbia, and the bottom right is of the sawmill industry in British Columbia, and you can see that those maps are different, uh, that the white spots on the maps are different. And that's the only point that I, that I want to make, and I'm not gonna spend any more time on these maps, the reason that those, um, that those maps are different is because strong networks of patronage had been established, uh, first of all in Japan between the rural areas and the emergent cities in Japan, and later on between Japan and the United States, Hawaii, Canada, um, because the whole labor system operated on a system of patronage, 
a system in which individuals would, would establish labor contracts, sign up laborers in Japan, and sponsor them to come and work in particular places. So uh, the mills in Vancouver, most of which developed uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, were very much organized along that patronage system as people sponsored, uh, first of all, their relatives and then others from the same village or from the same prefecture to come and work in, in the mills. And that fact is tremendously important in understanding the way in which the Powell Street community emerged as a community based on a system of labor patronage. And you see it expressed here in the map of where the workers in these different industries came from. And I could show you many more maps that would, that, that, that would uh, tell the story in more detail. Um, but let's go to Vancouver. This is the Hastings, uh, the first site of the Hastings sawmill, which is really the, the economic foundation of the city of, of Vancouver, the raison d'etre for, for this city. Uh, first of all, located in what is now Kitsilano, and uh, very soon moved to the south shore of the Burrard Inlet. Are most of the people in the room familiar with, uh, with, with Vancouver? And you'll know when I say the south shore of the Burrard Inlet, the foot of Board Street, very uh, two blocks down from, from Powell Street. This was the original site, and I think um, well, you'll see the, the, the subsequent site soon. So Vancouver incorporated in 1886. This is 1887. The railway arrives. This is the national dream. I've got a bunch of pictures here that, that depict uh, something about the way that Vancouver um, developed. It's a city in which neighborhoods meant a great deal. There were neighborhoods, uh, there was a significant neighborhood along Pender Street where the Chinese immigrant population had settled. Uh, they referred to it as Chinatown. And uh, to the north of that, along Powell Street, was uh, the area where eventually Japanese uh, immigrants uh, were to settle. The railway, arriving in 1887, allowed Vancouver to flourish as a city, explains uh, much of the reason why Victoria, which had flourished until that time, was superseded in population and in, in industry uh, by Vancouver, because that's where the railway terminated. That's what made it possible for Vancouver to become a place from which uh, people arrive from all different parts of the world and goods arrive uh, especially in terms of the primary industries, the logging industry, which was the most important. Logs came into Vancouver, they went to the sawmills, they became toothpicks or uh, building supplies. They got, were put back on the trains and went east. Goods and people came from the east. Uh, the ships came across the Pacific. In the early days they were uh, sailing ship, uh, tall ships and eventually those were supplanted uh, by steamships, and Vancouver became uh, the, th the thriving uh, metropolis, really, uh, of the west coast of Canada. There is the Hastings Sawmill that was established at the foot of Gore Street, just off Powell Street, and you'll see in the foreground, uh, this would bring us up to Powell Street in the early days, a few small uh, white houses um, the the uh, Japanese immigrant workers became the largest single ethnic group within the sawmills in Vancouver over the period um, from the 1890s until uh, the First World War. And we don't know a lot of detail about those early days. They lived on scows uh, floating in uh, what was already a very polluted harbor. Uh, the conditions of life were, were very poor. They, and as they, they left the scows and, and became uh, more settled, that their first um, residences and the first places of business were actually not on Powell Street, but on Alexander Street, which is one street north of Powell. Um, it was an area that had been built of substantial uh, two-story middle-class houses. Uh, when a white Vancouver population uh, lived there, and that population gradually moved away to places like the West End or the Fairview uh, Slopes. 
and Kitsilano, and uh, Alexander Street became the red light district of uh, Vancouver. The city fathers did not approve of the red light district, and they tried in various ways to close it down. Uh, but when the Japanese immigrants began to uh, establish themselves within the um, sawmills, they began to move into houses on Alexander Street, co-mingling with um, what were the, the, then the brothels of Vancouver. And we know something about the way they lived in those houses. Uh, there would be large numbers of single men uh, living in very crowded conditions. We hear stories about how they lived in boxes, or they slept in boxes, and they would get one would get into the box, and then they would lift the box on top, and the other would get uh, into the box so that as many as possible could sleep, and they, they were engaged in shift work. So uh, we hear stories about how the, 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 the sheets were still warm as one got up to go to work and another one got uh, into the box. And of course, some of those stories are just stories, but uh, anyway, conditions were very, um, were very crowded. Now, the way this worked was, as I said, a system of patronage. There were bosses um, called bosu, for those of you who uh, understand Japanese, um, who could speak some English, who had some negotiating skills, and they would round up gangs of, of, uh, of men, uh, the vast majority of whom would come for a short period of time, uh, work in the sawmills, or in fishing, or in logging, or in uh, railway construction, um, but the sawmills were the largest employer, uh, and the boss would, uh, uh, would uh, collect the money, uh, make the payments, send money home to Japan, act as a kind of banker, translator, uh, and eventually even as a marriage broker as, as the, the, the community of young men um, expanded and they needed wives, and I'll get back to that uh, in a few minutes. So um, this patronage system meant that the bosses initially uh, rented houses on Alexander Street and eventually moved to Powell Street, which became uh, more heavily populated initially in, in rental properties and eventually um, by the, the time of the 1940s, uh, the Japanese Canadians owned uh, the majority of the properties along uh, Powell Street, and you're going to hear about those uh, next week. So. This actually is, is Pender Street, it's not Powell Street, but I put this one in there so that you can see uh, the early transformation of the residential to commercial uh, landscape uh, in Vancouver. And I'm fascinated with studying the architecture as an expression of the way that people lived. Now all of these streets were initially um, sort of middle class housing, small um, small one and a half, sometimes two story houses with a picket fence around them, front yard and a, and a backyard uh, that transitioned from residential to a very different kind of landscape. And the way that they made it look more commercial and more urban, if, if this is the urban look uh, of the time, was to put a false front uh, on, on what had originally been a, a peak roof um, Victorian house and this happened along most of the streets that became commercial streets in the east end of Vancouver. Uh, as more and more uh, immigrants came and this is showing uh, some ships in the background and, and uh, Japanese immigrants coming off the ships that are wearing these white voter hats that were, I, I'm sure that there was a, a guy with a stand in Yokohama Harbor who was handing out the hats and saying five bucks for a hat, or probably wasn't five bucks, whatever, for a hat, because these are the hats that they wear in Canada. Well, as it turned out, it was only Japanese immigrants who wore those hats, but anyway. Um, and uh, here's another one. This one also shows a few women getting off. This is one of the old sailing ships, and they're still wearing those hats. Um, this is a very early uh, shot of um, Hastings Mill. I don't know if you can read the typing up above, but here this, this person is referred to as the first Chinaman and the first Jap, which is the, the language of the time, uh, who worked at uh, Hastings Mill. We actually know 
uh, quite a lot uh, about the story of this man, but I don't have time to tell it. And here's one a little later on. And you can see down here uh, was the, the gang of Japanese immigrant workers. And these numbers just increased, especially during the period from about 1907 to 1910, which was a period of uh, economic growth and massive growth of the sawmill industry um, in Vancouver. Uh, that period happened to coincide with two things. One, the closing of the American border in 1906, um, so that uh, Asian migration didn't occur at all, uh, or almost didn't occur at all, uh, to the United States. And, and as a result, a lot more Japanese immigration to Canada occurred. Uh, the, the Canadian government had already been very effective through the head tax in, in curtailing uh, Chinese immigration. There, were, there are a lot of strategic, uh, political, economic reasons why they didn't use the same um, strategies toward Japanese immigrants, and I don't have time to go into those details. Uh, but in uh, 1907, um, the, there had been uh, several thousand, we guess about 7,000, we're not really sure because adequate records weren't kept, but about 7,000. Uh, Japanese immigrants, almost all men, had come into Vancouver, were working in the sawmills, uh, and in September of 1907, uh, some rowdy uh, white men got very drunk and uh, staged a bit of a riot. They came along Pender Street and then along Powell Street, breaking windows and causing havoc. Um, and after that time, a lot of the Asian workers, both of Japanese and Chinese immigrant origin um, went on a strike, and the result was a negotiation between the city of Vancouver and the Asian workers, who, who represented a very, very large part of the labor force um, by that time. Uh, but their numbers increased in the sawmills, and can you read that? Um, toothpicks. Vancouver became the largest. The, the, the largest manufacturer of toothpicks in the world, among other things that they use for that wood. Okay, so here's Powell Street. So you can see a couple of these houses. This is 1889, and the laying of the uh, tracks uh, for the streetcars, uh, and this was the very beginning of the Vancouver streetcar system, uh, because Powell Street and this whole area surrounding Powell Street, which is now the downtown east side, was seen as a, 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 an important residential area for mainly clerks, people who worked in stores and offices, uh, and who were building these uh, small white houses. Here you see both a, a two-story and a one-and-a-half-story uh, white house on the side with the little picket fences uh, around them. Uh, this was seen as an up-and-coming residential area in the 1880s. And within a very few years, the entire street was filled with these um, small, uh, fairly modest, um, sort of uh, white collar, lower white collar homes. This is a picture looking across from the Fairview slopes uh, at um, Burrard Inlet in the distance at Falls Creek in front of that. And you can see that by this time, we're beginning to see the, the, the sawmill landscape that included uh, a lot of smoke. And back to Japan. Why is 1906, 1907 so important uh, when, if you go, if you remember those maps that I showed you, uh, the sources of migrants were very different in different parts of the city. This is Shiga Prefecture, uh, for any of you who know Japan, on the east coast of the Koto Lake, just a little bit south of Hikone City. Uh, this is this plain and these villages that you see are the largest source of Japanese immigrants uh, to Canada. It's commonly believed that it was Wakayama Prefecture, uh, which is where many of the fishers came from. In fact, it wasn't Wakayama Prefecture, it was Shiga Prefecture. Um, the difference is that the rate of return to Japan for Shiga Prefecture was much higher than for Wakayama. Uh, this is an alluvial plain, 
and in 1906 there was a major typhoon that wiped out the crops. People were literally starving to death. Uh, the houses were in, in, uh, inundated. Or well, I know there are a couple of physical geographers in the room. This is there is a I have a geomorphological map, but I didn't bring it today. This is a, a back swamp, and the river is just this is an alluvial river. It's got a beautiful deltaic fan. Um, just to the north of what I just showed you, uh, and and when the typhoons came and the crops were ruined, uh, people literally did uh, starve to death. There was no flood management, and it, it some uh, relations had been established between the villagers and the sawmills in Vancouver, and the result was thousands of young men leaving that exact plane. That picture, by the way, was taken in the 1980s. It doesn't look a whole lot different uh, on the surface um, than it did um, in the 1880s, except that there's a whole bunch of, of uh, hydraulic uh, system management going on today that you can't actually see. That's what the fields look like. And the objective was to <coughs> go to Canada, work for a while in Vancouver or wherever, come back to Japan and build a house. Now, what's really interesting there for uh, those of you who are you know, historians of Japan, if there are any, is that traditionally in Japan, the land was relatively scarce. That The social organization was there'd be one big land-owning house in the village surrounded by a whole bunch of tiny uh, thatch roof uh, cottages where most of the villagers lived in a, a kind of feudal uh, relationship uh, because they, they basically leased the land from the landowners. Well, these emigrant villages, as they were called, uh, started to look like a whole village of wealthy landowners as the migrants came back and built uh, these houses few pictures, beautiful, substantial houses that are still very beautiful today with uh, traditional gardens. And um, of course, it was impossible to have a whole village full of, of wealthy landowners because uh, there wasn't enough land for that and it went against the whole social system. So what they would do is come back and buy one or two cho. A cho is about the size of this, uh, uh, the center of this room here, and they would plant a little bit of rice and build a great big house. And uh, give money to the temple. This is a Buddhist temple and a Shinto shrine. And on the back of this particular uh, stone carving are the names of all of the immigrants who, who um, contribute to, to, to putting it there. And of course, they would also build a, a very extensive uh, grave. And one, one of the things that's very touching about this particular um, graveyard or haka is uh, that there is a, an obelisk um, there that has the names of 17 young men who were born in Canada on Powell Street uh, when were sent back to Japan for their educations, conscripted into the Japanese army, and all of them died in the Pacific. So that's just a, a little glimmer of some of the personal family stories. And I have many family stories that I can't tell. Can you see that? I can't see it here. Um, I, I won't dwell on this. Uh, this shows the impact, the demographic impact of migration on this particular village. As you see, the, the, the registered population on top and the resident population on the bottom, and that as that gap grows wider, it represents those who were leaving the village as migrants, uh, as labor migrants, uh, mostly, in this case, to go to Vancouver. Um, and this was happening, of course, all over Japan. In um, the case of this village, those lines came back together again after the 1940s as people came back and, and, and inhabited those houses that they'd been building. And in many parts of Japan, of course, they became permanent urban residents. Okay, so that's the back story. Back to Vancouver. This uh, picture was taken in 1907, and one of the results of the riot um, that I told you about was that there were a lot of photographs taken to record the damage, and so we have, as a result, of a very good sense of what Powell Street looked like. This uh, was a labor contracting uh, firm on Powell Street, um, and typically the front would have the offices. Uh, that the banking and the translating and, and especially the employment service and back from that front 
would uh, be a whole series of add-ons, build-ons. They called them longhouses, um, nagaya in, in, in Japanese, as they built onto the properties from the front to the back in order to take up all of the space. There are no longer any gardens, uh, just a whole series of, of different forms of housing, initially only for uh, the, the, the single men who came to work in the sawmills and eventually for families. And the housing changed in form and structure uh, as the, the needs of families and the community uh, changed. But this, uh, all, all of these buildings were, as you can see from that first slide, um, former uh, houses built by the white population and, and um, transformed uh, for the needs of the growing Nikkei community. Um, there's another labor contractor. This is the day after the 1907, September 8, 1907 riot. Uh, another one, you can see that this one was originally a two-story house that's had its, um, the front changed. Um, and eventually, um, they, as, as ownership took place, um, the uh, Japanese-Canadian immigrants began to build their own buildings. And this picture is interesting. This is a group from Hiroshima Prefecture, as a matter of fact, they're about it's a Saturday morning and they're going for a picnic, so all the cars are lined up and they're going somewhere uh, out of Vancouver for a picnic. And the building on the left was the first two-story building built on Powell Street by uh, Japanese Canadians. The building on the right, as you can see, is one of the older uh, houses that has, put, has had a false front uh, put on it to be transformed into the kind of building that made up uh, the Japanese Canadian commerce. And you see these buildings over and over. And then if you look in between uh, these two buildings, you'll see a, a one-story structure that represents the, the little businesses that filled in all the interstices. So in fact, there was Powell Street, but also the spaces between the houses became alleyways, and those were filled up with bathhouses and noodle shops and uh, all of the services that kept the uh, community going. This one was taken, this picture was taken in the 1980s, shows what's left of one of those houses. Some of you may have even seen this place. And just something uh, briefly about how the community transitioned from being a community of single man workers to a, a community in the full sense. After the Vancouver riot, that something called the Gentleman's Agreement was written between Canada and Japan that would curtail uh, migration except for people who were coming back. And there was a huge amount of back and forth. Uh, the, the men would come and work in the sawmill for a season, then they would go back to Japan for the agricultural season, plant the rice, harvest the rice, uh, I, and, and I always make a joke that there were many kinds of seeds planted during those uh, visits back to Japan and then they would go back to Vancouver and, and work again in the mills. Uh, many of the wives of, and children, of course, uh, were left behind and I just kind of like this picture because it, it sort of uh, depicts that fact. Um, and this is a, a wedding photograph. So. Uh, the, uh, after the, the so-called Gentleman's Agreement, which is officially the Hayashi Lemieux Agreement, Lemieux was the, uh, what's now the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, only uh, immediate family members um, could uh, come to Canada to join their families. And uh, many of these uh, workers were uh, young, unmarried men. And Japan, like almost every other country at the time, including most of Europe, uh, worked on a basis of arranged marriages. Um, and they simply extended that tradition uh, to a, a greater distance. Uh, photographs would be exchanged between the family of the bride and the family of the groom. Um, and uh, through a slight modification of, of the process, the wedding and the registration would take place in Japan. Um, and these are photographs of weddings. And then the women would find themselves uh, put on a ship, um, some of them very young, coming to um, 
to Canada, where they joined husbands, and there are all sorts of stories about how they got into Vancouver Harbor, got off the ship, and discovered that the guy waiting for them actually had sent a, a photograph of his more handsome friend, or a picture of his house that was actually Vancouver City Hall, um, and not the kind of very poor housing that actually existed on Powell Street. So, but the, the, the women t in oral histories tell us about how the women arrived, uh, and at five o'clock the next morning they were up and sent to work. Um, the, the luckier ones working together, this is in a fish canning uh, factory, the less lucky ones sent as domestic servants. Uh, imagine you've just arrived from Japan, you've just met your husband for the first time, and the very next morning you're working for a family in Shaughnessy and they have a vacuum cleaner, and you're told to get the vacuum cleaner and clean the house and you've never seen a vacuum cleaner. Uh, and you've never seen the kinds of clothes that Canadian women wear, so lots of stories. Those who worked in the factory settings um, brought their children, their babies on their backs, the toddlers running around in the fish guts on the floor. Um, this is a group of women in the sawmills. So we have a picture of life that is traditional but not traditional. Um, housing that is traditional in the sense of bringing families together, that's fine, it's just a pointer. Um, but not traditional, something that actually had, had, had never existed in any other place. The particular forms of, agri of, of architectural uh, change that went on in Vancouver. And pretty soon the streets start to look different. Instead of men hanging about in front of the, the labor contractors, we now have uh, some children. Uh, we have more and more stores and businesses that, and community organizations and groups that are catering to a new kind of population. And in, in this alleyway, um, beach, where you see this kind of, of uh, Shinto looking gate, uh, down there is a bathhouse and a, a, a tofu uh, place. And this uh, set of photographs was compiled in, I, I took it in Japan, I just actually photographed the family's album of the, the pictures that depict uh, a young man, whoops, a young man setting off for Canada, this picture is taken in Japan, changing his mode of dress, making good, and eventually becoming a store owner uh, on Powell Street with his family. Now, I'm just going to look at some of these buildings and why this, this place, uh, Powell Street, is architecturally fascinating, but of course, Architecture is only the outward manifestation of the lives that people lived. And, and um, this shows a building uh, on Powell Street. This was uh, the Horty family, or actually related to my family. And uh, uh, what was, oh, sorry, what was it? What was originally one of those Powell Street houses built out from the from the back uh, with um, rooms uh, to, to board the workers. Of course, the stucco came later. Um, and beside it is a purpose-built uh, boarding house. And what happened was a shift in the in, in the architecture from the converted homes of the white families to purpose-built apartment and and boarding. Uh, houses and if you go down Powell Street today, um, this was the location of the, the grocery store Fujia that some of you may be uh, familiar with, um, but you can tell the difference. And I don't have time to go into detail, but there are all sorts of, of ways in which you can tell uh, when the buildings were built by the, the mode of construction, the type of siding, the way that they put on the roofs, etc. And by looking at those cues and reading the landscape. You can tell when the buildings were built and the kinds of, uh, of renovations that were made to accommodate this very un unusual uh, or new form of, uh, of, of living. Uh, there's the same building from the other side. And this is kind of interesting. In the 1970s, this was all clad in uh, aluminum siding. Uh, but it, but at the time that it was built, it was originally a, a, one of those one and a half story houses and built back from the street. This was the Fukushima Dairy, actually. Uh, the store was the Fukushima Dairy. Built back in the street, a whole series of little apartments um, and, and rooms. 
This is on Alexander Street and in what was, uh, as I said, the red light district. And if you look at the back of this one, you see a whole series of apartments um, built back. This uh, actual whole set of structures was demolished by the city in the 1990s. So I have some pretty good photographs of it. Oh, um, and that's what it looked like uh, from the other direction. There was a family in each of those. And this looks quite different from the big square boarding houses um, that housed uh, single men. Uh, and looked like this. This was one of the purpose-built, in this case a three-story, one of the largest um, uh, boarding houses uh, that was built specifically for sawmill workers. The result was that Japanese Canadians built the largest concentration of boarding houses anywhere in North America uh, with the capacity to house a huge number of single men in particular, but single people uh, in particular. And um, they were part of what was then a thriving community. This is just a hand-drawn map that shows you what was there. Uh, by the 1920s, they were building more substantial brick buildings. Uh, these buildings are all still there. Uh, all of them built by Japanese Canadians as boarding houses, hotels, apartment buildings. Um, Case Seafood, I believe, is still there. I haven't been there for a little while. Uh, but the, the landscape transformed, of course, in order to accommodate um, both changing lifestyles, families instead of single men, but also the rising fortunes uh, of the community, because these are fairly substantial buildings. Um, Men and families would, would filter through this, this housing, which was always considered to be temporary, and then they would move up, if possible, to Cordoba Street, which is one street south. And if you know the area, Cordoba Street is uh, made up of a very substantial, uh, especially for the time, substantial two and a half story houses. It was known as uh, the rich person street. In Japanese, it's uh, Okane, Okane Mochi. Uh, the people who have money, and uh, a lot of the, those who moved up there were the the uh, the, the business people the, who who control commerce on Powell Street. Cordova Street actually hasn't changed very much uh, in the years since. Uh, also on Cordova Street was a Buddhist uh, temple, and this is uh, Sunday school at the Buddhist temple. Um, and behind these facades, all sorts of community organization going around, going on, a scout troop, um, commercial enterprises, a uh, department store. Of course, in the old days, department stores meant that you went up to the counter and asked for something, and they went and found it behind. Um, a new generation, uh, some of whom became nurses, and uh, a different kind of uh, wedding picture, of course, uh, in which we now have two people, and these are Nisei, second generation, uh, being married on Powell Street. Um, by the 1930s, this is what Powell Street looks like. And this is, was a parade for the crown prince of uh, Japan. And you can see that they are waving a combination of uh, Japanese and British flags. Of course, we had the Union Jack at that time. You'll see those street tracks. Uh, the, oh, darn. Those tracks that were being laid um, are still there, and of course they're still there today. On the left, that big building was the most substantial office building. It held uh, medical professionals, it held a bank, a real estate company, insurance, um, those uh, quaternary sector uh, economic activities that represent a, a, a a community that has uh, that is fully um, self-sufficient. That uh, building was built by one of the wealthiest immigrants on Powell Street, and he later went back to Japan and became a member uh, of Parliament. And then uh, all down the street, you see a combination of some of the old um, renovated houses and the new, uh, the newly built um, boarding houses and, and hotels uh, that continued to house. Uh, single workers right up until the 1940s. 
Oops. And um, this is that same grocery store that you saw in the family photo. Um, and this picture was taken in 1941 of a uh, young woman who was going to Japan for the first time. She was born on Powell Street. She was going to Japan for the first time uh, to, because her family had made good. She was going to, to meet and visit uh, her relatives. Uh, and, and this picture was taken before she went to get on the ship to go to Japan. She never came back to Canada. She uh, went to Japan. Uh, uh, conditions in Japan were bad and getting worse. Um, a, a, a marriage was arranged for her. She spoke English and with some Japanese, uh, spent the rest of her life speaking Japanese, and ended up actually in that cemetery that I showed you. There are many, many stories that illustrate just the, the, the things that people went um, through. Um, and that was 1941. This is early 1942. I'm not going to say anything about the uprooting, but within a few months um, of that photograph being taken, of course, Powell Street was to become uh, no more uh, as a Japanese-Canadian uh, community. Instead, people spent a long time under curfew. Within 24 hours, uh, everyone had lost their jobs. All of the insurance policies were canceled. The newspapers were shut down. Uh, a curfew uh, was imposed, children were turned away from schools. Uh, all of those things happened within a 24-hour period, and within a matter of weeks or months, um, the, the uh, livestock um, pens at the PNE had been converted into a, another uh, form of housing. And if we think of Powell Street as conversion of housing, the PNE was a, a much different kind of conversion of housing. These are livestock pens. Uh, one pen for each family, a couple of blankets and whatever they could carry uh, of the um, community that had been theirs and eventually uh, being rounded up at the rail yards, put on trains and ending up um, in the interior of British Columbia with another form of housing that uh, was uh, put up very quickly and shoddily. Um, that's the first. That's the first winter, which would be then the winter of 1942-43, um, and in effect, this is what became of the houses um, on Powell Street. But it's a story of labor, of, of the labor that built Vancouver, the labor that built a, a thriving uh, community. It's a story of the families, it's a story of the houses, and this very fascinating but uh, unique uh, architecture that uh, facilitated a particular way of life, which I call a paradox because it involved laboring in, in, in modern industry in order to sustain a very traditional way of life in Japan in a domestic landscape, which I showed you, which looked very, very different from Powell Street. No effort was made to reproduce that kind of traditional housing on Powell Street. In fact, uh, if people aspired to be farmers, which many of them did, and they couldn't go back to Japan and to those beautiful houses, uh, instead they went to the Fraser Valley and they planted strawberries and, and, and they harvested blueberries, uh, which became the basis of, of a very large proportion of, of, of the Fraser Bar Valley farming uh, communities, uh, one of the most important um, farming uh, areas in all of Canada, one of the most fertile parts of the entire world. That story, of course, is another one of uprooting and expropriation of, of houses. Uh, Powell Street wasn't that village within the city. It wasn't a question of trying to reproduce Japanese houses was a question of creating a place where people could forge uh, a, 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 the, the, the kinds of links that would allow them to continue their families to live, to make a living uh, toward a much different kind of, of goal, which was um, in, in, in Japan or the Fraser Valley. It was only by the 1930s and uh, the start of the 1940s that actually Powell Street reached this uh, kind of uh, economic and community maturity 
so that people actually called it home in a different sense. And the, the buildings began to change so that uh, you, when you moved up to uh, Cordova Street into one of those um, beautiful two and a half story houses, that was what people now aspired to because they were Canadians looking for a, a, a Canadian house, not a traditional house in Japan. It, it took about four decades for that transition to occur from a Japanese immigrant to a Japanese Canadian community. And as we know, of course, that uh, was destroyed as a physical community. But as I said, what was left behind was the largest concentration of rooming houses anywhere in North America. Next week, you're going to hear something about what happened to those properties as they changed hands. But if uh, Japanese Canadians were marginalized from the, the economic and social life of the rest of white Vancouver, which they certainly were, as were uh, Chinese Canadians on, on Pender Street, uh, Powell Street has continued to be a landscape of marginalization. Those boarding houses, uh, which um, I don't know a great deal of detail about how the transitions of residents have taken place since the 1940s, but I do know that by the 1950s and 60s, there were still a lot of mill workers uh, living in those boarding houses, a lot of single men who moved in and out of town, uh, going out to, to work in the log logging camps for part of the year, coming into town to work in the sawmills for part of the year, or working in the fisheries. Uh, their ethnicity had changed, but they were still, a lot of them, uh, single male workers. Uh, and over a period of, of decades, those, there was a transition from single workers to non-workers, uh, the, the marginalized population of, of Vancouver, people who, uh, who have struggled with mental illness or with substance abuse or with other uh, processes that have marginalized them from the rest of society. A, a lot of them, uh, First Nations people who have come to the city and found that, that uh, like for many other kinds of migrants, the city didn't hold all that it hoped that it, that, that it would. So Powell Street is this sort of destination uh, that is a, a place of transition and moving on to another kind of life for a whole series of, of different groups of people that have inhabited the, the streets um, and, and houses. Uh, and of course, to Powell Street today um, is not only still one of the largest concentrations of, of very poor quality uh, rooming houses, um, but also one of the, the largest concentrations of, of poverty um, and marginalization that you could find um, in, in any city. Um, and that's another whole set of stories that, that we need to look at very carefully because those stories tell us not only about the people who live there, but about the entire society that produced that place. And Powell Street needs to be understood not just in terms of the experiences of the people who live there, but of the city of Vancouver uh, and of uh, the dynamic sets of political, economic, social, cultural relationships that make up a city. So thank you. some time for some questions from the audience. Under the, the patronage system, can you comment on the treatment of the Japanese worker, the wage rates, and the relationship between the boss and the enterprise they work for? Yeah, um, there are different stories. Some of the, the bosses uh, were very unpopular. Um, and obviously exploited the workers. Others were beloved. Um, so uh, there were a great deal of variations, and those variations have a lot to do with relations that have been established already in villages in, in Japan. So in some cases, they were exploitive kinds of employment agencies. So just to tell you one story, my grandfather arrived uh, on Powell Street in 1906. 
um, went to an employment agency for his prefecture, which was Nagano Prefecture. He got a job working for the CPR, cutting lumber up on the Skeena. So he went up there and he, he cut lumber for an entire season. And in September, he went down to get his pay. And they said, uh, well, under the contract, you get a fraction of, um, the, of the profits for the year. And we didn't make any profits this year. So here's 250, get on the boat, go back to Vancouver. Uh, so there were lots of those um, sorts of stories, and you know, somebody wrote that contract, somebody negotiated it, whether they actually knew what they were doing or not. And then my grandfather went and became a boss himself. Um, so I don't know what about the kind of contracts that he might have, have written. Um, most of them, however, uh, were much longer term. So those who were working in the sawmills, the, the story is that they actually provided a pretty good living, seven times the salary that they would have had in Japan is, is, is what's estimated around the turn of the century, and they were certainly highly organized. But there were others who ended up, uh, for example, starving in uh, coal mines on Vancouver Island. Um, and uh, it's clear that some of them had strong family and community ties, and some of them didn't. And I think that probably uh, expresses a, a, a full gamut of different kinds of labor relations. And of course, the, the, the companies that they worked for uh, varied as well, in terms of the kinds of demands that were made, the kind of contracts that, that were made, in terms of the, the skill at negotiation. So there's a lot of factors there. Mm -hmm. um, has your research engaged research engaged at all with the uh, the identities of the builders and maybe the architects later on uh, of some of the structures you're talking about? Um, yeah, there are stories. Um, there's a lot of physical evidence, of, of course. Mm -hmm. You can tell which of the buildings were built prior to I believe it's 1902. 1902. Hastings Mill um, got a saw that could uh, uh, that could saw beveled lumber. Beveled lumber um, revolutionized building in Vancouver because it goes up so quickly. The the the, the, the planks, you know, one on top of the other, as opposed to the old uh, tongue and groove siding. Um, so that's actually the biggest clue as to the architectural history. Uh, and you can tell pre-1902, post-1902, give or take. Mm -hmm. um, so the most important way to find out what was going on is just the physical evidence. And sometimes, of course, it's been covered with stucco or, 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 or vinyl or whatever. But there is still quite a lot of physical evidence there. And I've got well, hundreds of pictures of little corners of buildings or or, or, or the eaves of, of the houses, or the windowsills, or, or whatever, uh, mostly of buildings that aren't there anymore, because I started doing this in the 80s and, and, and 90s. Um, but of course, that's only one aspect uh, of the building. It basically, it was got beveled lumber. It was probably built by a Japanese Canadian. If it doesn't, it was, it was a, 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 a refit. Um, but the other story is the financing. You know, for many years, most of the uh, buildings were leased. And by the 1930s, the majority of the buildings were owned. So I've sort of mapped that shift in the landscape from rental to ownership. And uh, there are different kinds of buildings. The, the commercial buildings, like the, the labor contractors, didn't own the buildings. They tended to lease them. But then to, to shift their assets from those leased buildings into uh, the more substantial um, uh, boarding houses. And each boarding house catered to um, men or families from a different part of the country. So they were organized by prefecture. Okay, so this is a Shiga prefecture boarding house. And almost everybody who lives there is from Shiga prefecture, and they work at this mill. Um, and, and so the, the assets, of course, were the assets of the contractors, the bosses, uh, who gradually built up enough that they could build uh, the buildings. Uh, there is another whole layer, though, that substantial office building uh, financed from Japan. 
uh, by either corporations or wealthy individuals, mostly corporations in Japan, who invested in uh, buildings on Powell Street. It's hard to know just exactly how much, where the money came from. You know, there aren't there aren't records, but we know that it, it was going on. And the more substantial brick buildings that are being built uh, by the end of the 20s, when financial times were flourishing, um, represent very often partnerships um, with uh, capital from Japan. Uh, so it, it's a complex set of business relationships linked into familial relationships. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I used to work down there. Mm -hmm. um, I had an office there over, over top of Sunrise Market, so it's a bit of a, a nostalgic mm -hmm. trip for me. In the uh, wedding hall. Uh, it, it, this was uh, the two-story building beside the, the sunrise at the corner okay. of Gore. Yeah. Uh, so this which, was which Fuji, Fuji Chop Suey. Hmm? This was Fuji Chop Suey. Uh, or was that? Or, or? At that time, in the 80s and 90s, it was all Sunrise Market. So oh, there was okay. a parking yeah. lot above, yeah. and, and then the two-story building beside, we were on the upper floor. With the balcony. Yes, that's yes. right. Which was more of a Chinese uh, style. Uh, sure, but certainly now. Um, but not when it was built. Yeah. Uh, what I'm really interested in uh, in, in, in that history <laughs> is uh, Oppenheimer Park and, and whether that was carved out or, or whether it was just always there uh, and, and uh, recognized as a park. Did they demolish something to create the park or not? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I've never seen any evidence of buildings there. Do you know? It was always a park. Yeah. Was it? It's called Powell Street Grounds. Powell, it was Powell Grounds. Powell Grounds. Uh, yeah, that's where the Asahi baseball team played. Uh, and the, more than half of the Asahi team, by the way, came from the village that I showed you in, in the, uh, the village of Kaidaima in, in Shiga Prefecture. Um, but yeah, it, it was, I'm sure the, the park would have been created then in the 1880s. Named after the mayor. Yes, who, who was the, the mayor of Vancouver at the time. And of course, a lot of the ethic upon which Vancouver was built included, of course, Stanley Park. And that people had very, uh, planners had very specific ideas then about how many parks there should be. I think there was a, was a question. Warren, did you have your hand up? Or? Yeah, I, I was just wondering whether there was any data what proportions of the men who came over in the early days, particularly, went back to Japan? The vast majority. Um, yes, there, there are data. Uh, I have um, a record of 36,000 individuals, and a pretty complete record. Um, the, the system was that, that father and eldest son would go out to work when the farming allowed them to. They would earn money and come back and put that money into housing and farms. Only then, after the, the future of the family had been secured, would they send second and third sons, uh, who would work so that they could then establish their own family. But they couldn't get married and establish their own families until the eldest son was settled. Um, so it was three stages, father and eldest son and, and various in-laws. Um, coming and going, investing the money. Uh, second and third sons uh, working and, if possible, going back to the village and starting their own household, and in some cases staying in Canada. And then the younger sons, who might be easily a third generation by, say, World War One, we had three generations, um, young men of 12 and 13 uh, who would have finished middle school in Japan, sent to Canada to go to night school, learn English, and they were to be the Canadian branch of the family, and those were very often the ones who stayed. There were quite a few hands over here. Um, I'm just curious if you can speak to the, the paradox that you were talking about, um, the laboring, uh, laboring in the modern industry and, like, and then going back to, um, to Japan to live that traditional life. Um, was it the majority of men who went back? And, 
and building the houses, yeah. that, that traditional lifestyle, and why was that not sort of brought into the houses that were built on Powell Street or in and around? Uh, the, the simple answer is that, yes, the majority of men went back. They didn't want to invest in houses on Powell Street. They wanted to invest in houses in Japan. They didn't want to live as laborers uh, in, in poor conditions in the Hastings Mill. Um, they wanted to be farmers in Japan. And, and really, the paradox is that the only way to maintain a traditional, a very traditional life in Japan in a traditional house with a traditional garden, uh, going to a traditional temple just down the street, uh, was to engage in modern uh, waged factory labor, which was in many ways an Um So, yeah, they weren't interested. Um, and the next generation, which, had, which didn't want to live in Japan, wanted to live in a two and a half story uh, Vancouver style house on Cordova Street. So, um, Powell Street is very, a very pragmatic place. Uh, full of a kind of architecture that served the economic needs of the community. So is there any hands up behind me? So, yeah, I have a couple of questions. One to follow up on that one. Also, thank you. I found that to be wonderful and wonderfully eloquent uh, portrait of the, of the community. Um, but two questions. One to follow up on that one, uh, and then one that I was thinking of earlier. Uh, that paradox, did, Besides being a, a kind of an irony to observe in the history, did that paradox express itself um, in either context? So was that paradox experienced as a tension, say, in returns to um, agricultural life in Japan? Did the experience of having been a laborer in Vancouver ever press up against that return? Uh, well, there's another paradox, of course. It has to do with modernizing Japan. And that is that nowadays in Japan, no village is very far from a city. And uh, so in the 1890s, uh, they would uh, go by, uh, by cart, buggy, to get to the nearest railway, to get to Yokohama, to get on a ship. Uh, and the only possibilities were to, 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 to farm uh, in the traditional way or to go to a city to work. Well. Of course, over this period of time, uh, the entire transportation landscape is transformed, the entire economy is transformed, uh, Japan uh, becomes the, the most educated country in the entire world by the 1890s, has the highest rate of literacy uh, in the world. And so if you go <coughs> to that village today with the pictures that, that I showed you, and that's pretty much what it looks like today, these are, remain traditional families. They still have a little plot of land, but they are architects, teachers, uh, civil servants who get in the car every day and go downtown uh, to work. And it's only maybe a 15 minute uh, or 20 minute drive or a, an hour's commute on the train, which is pretty common in Japan, uh, for, for something that would have taken days um, in the 19th century. So there's a paradox built upon paradox. Mm. And my er earlier question that I was going to ask is whether in these rich oral historical and personal um, uh, recollections and uh, sources, you find evidence of interaction between Japanese immigrants, uh, or Japanese Canadians, and the other diverse inhabitants of the East End, Jewish, Italian, Chinese, uh, and uh, uh, other, and whether that shifts over time as well. Yeah. Relatively little. Certainly, um, commercial uh, interactions with uh, Chinese Canadians, quite a lot of them. Um, and probably the most important multicultural mixer was the Asahi baseball team, because it was a citywide uh, baseball league uh, at which the Japanese Canadians excelled. And you know, many people see that as, as symbolic of the, the Nisei generation actually kind of showing some muscle culturally mm -hmm. and literally. Um, but there's not much of that. Um, there was a, also a, a seedier side.
to, there's a seedier side to every community, right? And things like the nightclubs and the, 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 the gambling saloons, uh, we hear stories of organization going on, especially that involved um, uh, interaction between the Japanese Canadian and Chinese Canadian communities. In fact, that building, which was Fuji Chop Sui above Sunrise Market, was considered the wholesome restaurant. That was the restaurant where women could go, um, and uh, that was where wedding receptions were held, where that balcony is up there. And uh, there's a sign apparently there that, that, that talked about not going to the Chinese um, establishments, but you know, staying here on Powell Street where things are more wholesome. So you get these sort of inklings of uh, a kind of denigration of other groups. Mm -hmm. and, um, but in general, you know, not very much. Of course, there are the churches. Um, and, and in particular, the Catholic Church, which has a mission there just across the street from Powell Street. So that was an important inter interaction. And um, in the professions, because um, Japanese Canadians could not hold professional licenses. So, for example, uh, you couldn't be, you could be trained as a pharmacist, but you couldn't dispense. So, uh, arrangements were made with a white pharmacist to actually be a kind of a front for the work that was actually being done by a Japanese Canadian mm -hmm. pharmacist who was just as well trained. That, that, that kind of thing. But it, it was, a, on the whole, certainly culturally, socially, very separate. Mm -hmm. We maybe have time for one more question. I there, think was, there was, there was one here. And it's very factual, so <laughs> not an interesting. I don't know. <laughs> Are there? Is there anyone else who wants to ask one this one last question? Vincent has his hand. What are you, you want to ask your factual question? So I, I'm just curious. I mean, I, you may have said it already, and I imagine it. Um, change at the time, but for the people who did go back, mm -hmm. was there a kind of average stay? Was it like what was the turnover rate? That changed over time. Um, for in the early years, uh, like from the 1890s when it first started, uh, certainly until World War One, it was back and forth, a lot of back and forth. Um, after World War One, people began to be more established, and there were a lot more stayers because there was a whole new generation of, of younger men who were coming. Uh, getting married through this picture bride uh, system and staying uh, permanently <coughs> uh, throughout the 1920s that became more and more and more established but of course Japan was changing too and there were different kinds of economic opportunities developing in Japan um, and so that that transient migrant worker population pretty much had slowed down by uh, by world, the time of World War one and they were all back in Japan in their beautiful homes. Um, and their children then were becoming educated and becoming uh, professionals. So by the 1930s, when of course there's a, another economic downturn, this is an opportunity for people on Powell Street to become more established because they bought up a lot of properties cheaper in the 1930s. Um, and so by that time, it's pretty much, this is the Japanese Canadian community. That's Japan and, and they're very different places. All right, well, uh, on that note, uh, why don't we thank Audrey again for <laughs>